Um, aha, so Oliver started the recording. So just a reminder, uh, Andy's going to give his lecture on Marxist Capital, Volume 1, Chapters 19 to 22, for about 45 minutes or so, and we'll have half an hour or so for discussion afterwards and finish at half past seven. So, uh, Andy, are you, you're going to share your screen? Yeah, very much so. Thank you very much for that. Um, so, uh, yeah, it is extremely topical, I have to say, with demonstrations and strikes this week, here in the UK at least, but of course it's a big issue in any case. Um, so this is what I'm going to cover. I will do a very brief review of the, the previous part, because a lot of it feeds in actually to this part. And so this is part six of volume one. It's quite short. But I will manage to, <laughs> will manage to uh, take a good three quarters of an hour, I'm sure, to go into it. Um, but we will have time for discussion. So this is what I'm going to cover each of the chapters with a couple of points for commentary as we go through. So this is my sort of schema for what the central uh, parts of volume one look like. And as you will recall, I make quite a big deal as does Marx about the movement from circulation into production and then back again. And this is a case in point, that's where we are because th these chapters are about how the commodity labor power presents itself for exchange. Uh, so it's a question of form of appearance of the capital labor relation. And it's the wage which is the exchange for labor power. Now, what Marx explains extremely well, in my opinion, is that the wage is uh, mistakenly uh, understood to be an exchange for labor. And he really uh, develops this distinction fully. And of course, the distinction goes right back to when he started going back uh, from circulation at the very beginning into production and this key distinction between labor power and labor activity. And so he sort of does it uh, like a reprise of that, but now with a much more developed uh, understanding, he's able to explain the surface appearance and why it is a distortion and indeed an inversion of the underlying reality. So this sort of sense of the dialectic between essence and appearance is very much part of the construction of Marx's argument. And there's just one other little um, subtlety that I want to add to this, which is he sees the wage form as the necessary form of appearance of the exchange value of labor power. And then there's a further development, which is that the wage form itself might take different forms or different configurations, if you like. And in the, in Marx adopts the Hegelian language here, that this would be the actualization of the form of appearance into, if you like, different types of appearance. So here we are. This is the circuit that Marx is now completing in, in a whole sort of a cycle of how wage, labor, and capital really are and how they appear to be right um so what in terms of reviewing chapter 17 this is really marx's does a lot about the magnitude of the value of labor power and he defines what the value of labor power is as being the value of the means of subsistence habitually required by the average worker and in that discussion, you will either read or will recall reading uh, that he includes certain points and excludes others. He excludes the cost of developing labor power and he excludes different sorts of labor power. So the three main variables, given those assumptions, the three main variables that he's interested in and what he's really interested in is not just the, uh, the value of labor power per se, but the relationship between the price of labor power and the magnitude of surplus value. It's, it's how those two things interrelate that he's really interested in in his chapter. And of course, given his assumptions, then the one of the main variables is the length of the working day. Uh, another main variable is the intensity of labor. And another main variable is the productivity of labor. And so Marx makes these exclusions, which, as I've really sort of 
repeatedly made the point slightly against the evidence which she's provided us which is that they do matter uh, also they also matter in terms of the relationship between the price of labor power and the amount of surplus value okay but that is his argument and in particular marx argues uh, the driver overall is the raising of the productive power of labor especially in england after around about 1850 or so then in chapter eight um chapter 18 sorry he gives a, a summary of uh, he discusses different ways in which the rate of surplus value can be represented and he settles and confirms what he's told us before which is the rate of surplus value is the ratio between the surplus value produced and the value of the labor power uh, which is employed in order to produce it so this uh, ratio of s over v now what he also emphasized is that um, capital is really essentially about the command over unpaid labor and he distinguishes his position from the adam smith and if you like the standard classical labor theory of value he's in emphasizing surplus labor or unpaid labor okay um he also makes a couple of other points right uh and he repeats a really essential point right which is that the secret of the self valorization of capital resolves itself into the fact that it has at its disposal a definite quantity of the unpaid labor of other people okay now there is some discussion here right about what these the different versions of this formula mean okay what what is the sort of substance behind them and the ratio of surplus labor over necessary labor i mean you could say surplus labor time necessary labor time these are subdivisions of the working day and so the dimensions here are of time uh, they're about the process of producing the commodities and these two are about the product that's been produced they're sort of uh, components of the value product that is produced and the unit here is not time it's money so uh, in other discussions this distinction is quite important these are time these are money okay you end up with the same ratio but if you like we're looking at it from different angles and the different angles are really about how the one is represented as the other how labor time is represented in the commodity form as the price of the commodity as a certain amount of money now uh, the relate it's a relation between these two things of course the process comes before the finished product but in any stable arrangement the one presupposes the other and what you've got is the connection between these two things is not one of inputs and outputs it's one of essence and appearance again it's a matter of a relationship between the substance of value and its form form of value okay this happens to be very important when we come to wages as well so Marx himself at the beginning of part six on wages makes a very strong connection with the arguments he's already been putting we've just reviewed in chapter 17. he basically says i've already gone through the major um what's the word i say variables the major reasons why the magnitude of price of labor and surplus value interact how they interact and how the one might be taken away from the other how they might both increase and so on okay and he says basically that gives us the basis for understanding the laws of wages it's, they're not the same but they follow on from this variation of the value of labor power and surplus value and then he makes a second point right he says the distinction between the exchange value of labor power and the sum of means of subsistence into which this value is converted now appears as a distinction between nominal and real wages now this is actually uh, a lot of these things are going to seem a bit pedantic okay but this is actually a really interesting way around that he puts it he starts off with the exchange value of labor power not the value of labor power 
And what he says is basically the wage buys the means of uh, subsistence, right? And that's the value that the wage is converted into. Okay. So you've got the wage, which the money wage, which is the nominal uh, wage. And then you've got the real wage, which is the commodities that are bought, the use values, the stuff which the wage allows the worker to buy. That is an interesting way around. And it's not the normal way around that he presents the value and exchange value of a commodity. Okay, so we've got something special or distinct going on here, right? Um, I think that Marx's treatment of the variables of labor power and surplus value is, was a major breakthrough. I mean, it established a different paradigm uh, from a perspective of the working class. Uh, in my view is this second point that he's making here about the exchange value of labor power needs further development than the point to which Marx, Marx took it. And I'll try to explain that as we go on. Okay, um, the next chapter Marx writes about is the transformation of the value of labor power into wages. All right, so he's developing from classical bourgeois yes. political economy. And he considers uh, it, the state of political economy to have reached a complete impasse, theoretically, on the basis of what is the value. Because they asked the question, they asked the wrong question, basically. The question that they got stuck on was what is the value of labor? Which Marx explains very, you know, he, he's good at this, right? He goes through how that's a meaningless question because labor is the substance of value so it's the what is the value of itself right it's a, it is a tautology in the worst sense of the word right um and it ends up with a logical impasse either the wages are less than the value it's created by labor in which case they're non-equivalent to the value that labor creates. And so the sort of the idea that commodities exchange their equivalent value, that is broken, or they are the equivalent of the value that's created, in which case there's no space for surplus value. There's no point then in capitalism, it couldn't exist, okay? Because the whole point he's told us time and time again is to generate a, a surplus value that expands the capital, okay? Now, the, the riddle is solved by Marx, by his understanding that there's not one exchange, but there's a double exchange which takes place between workers and capital. The one exchange is in circulation, the other is in production. Okay, so in circulation, wages are paid to the worker and their labor power is bought. In production, that labor power functions under the command of the capitalists and they are put to work, the worker is put to work. Okay, so what we've got is the functioning of labor power in production. So Marx recasts the question, not what is the value of labor, but what is the value of labor power? And from that, he develops a whole series of very interesting themes, some of which we'll look into and some of which you might want to develop further, right? They're, they're all um, significant. Uh, and it's sort of like floodgates open. When, once this point is understood, uh, and it can only be understood, by the way, from a working class perspective, you cannot understand this point, or at least it proved impossible within the bourgeois horizon uh, of classical political economy to develop the labor theory of value into the theory of surplus value and this double exchange. So Marx restates his basic position. Um, and some of these points of clarification are about what is the law of value as it operates in the capitalist mode of production. And what he's saying is that let's be a bit careful here, right? The producer is not paid for the product of their labor. Okay, that, they're not paid for that, right? If they were, we'd be back to this whole question of uh, how comes there's any surplus value at all, right? Um, even under simple commodity production, uh, the payment is indirect, right? It's not a direct payment for their labor, but for the product of their labor. And under capitalism, that's not the case either, right? Under capitalism, the exchange is between the worker and the capitalist, between the worker and capital. So it's a class relation, right? 
So the worker is uh, obliged to sell their own labor power. Okay. So, and you can't get out of this by playing linguistic tricks. He has quite a, it's in a footnote, I think, but he has quite a critique of Proudhon at this point. And it's quite contemporary, actually, in terms of how there's certain strands of social science, which if you just rename the language, you can solve the problem. Well, actually, no, it is, it's a real issue. It's a substantive issue, and it's a real distinction. Um, we could call them whatever you like, but the distinction would still be there, right? Um, so the expression of labour, uh, which political economy had used up to that point in terms of the value of labour, is is a, a false concept, if you like, insofar as it doesn't allow for the distinction between essence and appearance to, to be made, to be uh, brought into light, okay? And so what you get is an extinction of the distinction. It's extinguished, right? Okay. So it's only through separating labor power and labor activity that we can see the dynamic behind the scenes of what's really going on. Because on the surface, it looks like wages pay for the labor of the worker. But what Marx is saying is, well, they don't, do they? What they pay for is the labor power of the worker. Okay. So what you get is the emergence of what Marx calls the wage form. So uh, what classical political economy was talking about, or the phrase that it used, uh, that I mean, different writers use slightly different phrases. So natural price, price of labor. Okay. But when they actually began to talk about it or write about it rather, as soon as their inquiry went in the right direction, they were, what they were really asking is what is the cost of producing the worker, okay, or reproducing the worker. So although they would might write the value of labor power, what they were actually uh, beginning to probe was the value of labor power. Okay, so Marx is really, you know, he takes some quite a long um, uh, deconstruction of bourgeois political economy on these points, right? And so the reason I'm laboring it here is because Marx considers, and this is like a key quote from him, I think, wages are the converted form of the value or price of labor power. Okay, right? So once you've established that labor power has a price uh, because it has a value and the value can move with money form, then of course there must be a way that that's paid for and that's what wages are. That's the wage form. So, as I've said, it, uh, uh, I've already made this point, uh, I forgot the sequence, but basically, it, under the wage form, it appears as though all labour is paid labour. And as Marx is uh, wont to do, he gives us a sort of a customary example. These, these figures are very realistic for his day, for adult workers, adult male workers for his day. So, say you've got... Um, a value of three shillings, which represents the paid portion of the working day, which is the six hours of essential labor to replace the labor power. And, but the whole working day is 12 hours. OK, so it would appear that the three shillings is payment for 12 hours work. But actually, it's only payment for the equivalent value of the labor power, which is produced in the first six hours work. The first uh, configuration of uh, the wage form are time wages. Okay. Um, uh, Mark sees is the fundamental form. The reason it's fundamental form is because in the class relation which we have here, uh, labor power has to be sold for a given period of time. Okay. So it's within a period of time that the, that the sort of contract is made. Okay. Uh, Changes in the relative value or price of labor power and surplus value. He's going back again, once again, to the ideas he's developed in chapter 17 here. Uh, excuse me. Uh, now, for example, if the worker has to work longer days, say rather than 10 hours, 12 hours, then they will be producing more value. If their wage does not increase, then all of that extra value it produced will be an extra surplus value. It could be that their wage increases somewhat. So some of 
uh, their value comes back to them. But uh, again, there'll be more surplus value. Okay, so this is the, the, the sort of the relation between the law of wages in this sense and the question of how the production process as a value relation works. Marx uh, makes it clear that the sum of money which the worker receives for his daily or weekly labor are his nominal wages. His wages estimated in value. Okay, so, and then he goes on, the average price of labor is the average daily value of labor power divided by the average number of hours in the working day. I mean, I've just talked about a 10 hour day or a 12 hour day, which are the sort of hours that Marx was habitually using corresponding to the relations of his time. Okay, so if you've got uh, the same wage for 10 hours or 12 hours, then actually the real wage rate is uh, lesser for the workers working a 12 hour day. So what Marx says is you have to divide the daily rate down into the uh, hourly rate in effect, okay? Uh, and again, we just use his example. Uh, so we've got a three shillings daily wage rate, uh, which as we've already said, this will be reproduced or this, this amount of value will be produced in six working hours, right? But if the working day is 12 hours, then what we're actually being paid is three shillings divided by 12 hours, which we have to go into pence here. So that's three pence an hour. But if the working day, if the worker would still get being paid three shillings for a day's wage, but they only work 10 hours, then of course their hourly rate would be slightly higher. It would be 3.6 pence an hour. Uh, of course, it'd be three shillings divided by 10. Okay, and that, this is an, an important point in terms of making comparisons. So Mark says the unit of measurement for time wages is the price of the working hour. Now, it, there are lots of uh, struggles in Marx's time precisely around the price of the working hour, the wage paid uh, for each working hour, right? Um, so he's got here, you might remember the building worker strike of 1860, because we looked at this back in chapter 10. And the footnote could be a bit fuller, but it, it does indicate that, that that connection is made, right? And he actually says that this strike uh, took place because the building capitalists were trying to reduce the hourly rate of the building workers, right? Um, you know, which... Uh, might have some resonance today. The other type of struggle uh, which happened was the question of overtime rates. The increase in the price of labor when the working day is extended beyond a certain normal limit takes place in various British industries in such a way that the low price of labor during the so-called normal time compels a worker to work during the better paid overtime if he wishes to obtain a sufficient wage at all. Okay. Um, this again is something which happens a lot to this day. Uh, Marx, I, I'm not sure, I, to my memory, I think this is the first time he brings this point in, that as well as capitalists competing by increasing the productivity of the workforce under their control, uh, they can compete by wage cuts. And he gives an example here. Again, this is an echo back to something he told about us before, back in chapter 10, which are these bakers uh, who were really screwing their workforce. And I mean, to an incredible degree, he's saying basically for the same wage, some bakers are forcing their workforce to uh, work 18 or 20 hours a day rather than the only 12 hours a day. Okay. And he comments that a lot of these even more overworked workers would be or undersellers uh, employed by the undersellers are foreigners and youths okay who are obliged to accept almost any wages they can obtain so it comes in this question of sort of uh, more oppressed sections of the working class being obliged to take lower wages uh, in this kind of like side way he's very aware of it um this picture is not of the building worker strike. If anybody's got a picture of the building worker strike, I'd love to use it. Uh, I do draw attention to it because it's slightly gendered. <laughs> and we'll see that this question of um, 
wage rates and gender was an issue in Marx's day as it continues to be today. Um, right, so the next form are peace wages. Uh, now, uh, this is a wage which is paid per unit produced. So this is a sort of a further development on the time wage, which is the wage paid per day normally, or potentially per hour, right? Uh, okay. Um, although, sorry, the building workers strike was actually because they were resisting hourly pay. Uh, they wanted uh, daily pay, right? On average, uh, it will be known what's the normal daily output. So once it's known what a normal daily output of an average worker in a given employer or in a given industry is, then it's not hard to work out, okay, how does that resolve into the rate per item that's being produced? And this is known as the piece rate, okay? So the wages are paid not by time, but by how much product is produced. Uh, in well the time is disappears into the background at that point okay for example instead of uh, three pence an hour which is what they would have been paid if they were paid three shillings for 12 hours uh, say the workers produce in each hour two items then they'll be paid one and a half pence per item that's an example again from Marx okay Marx sees this very much as a way of measuring the intensity of labor because uh, the more intense worker can produce more items per hour than the less intense worker or the same worker under more or less intense conditions. I mean, driving themselves forward or being driven forward to, to work at a more rapidly, a greater rate. It, and Marx points out that in the personal interest of the worker that he should strain his labor power as intensely as possible this in turn enables the capitalist to raise the normal degree of intensity of labor more easily because they're all striving to produce more product. Moreover, the lengthening of the working day is now in the personal interest of the worker, since with it, his daily or weekly wages rise. So you can see that this way of paying is more to the advantage of capital uh, than labor. This picture is of... Um, these uh, workers, they went on strike. This is actually from Salt Lake City in 1910. And these uh, young women were finishing off the chocolates. That was their job to finish the chocolates. And uh, they were paid by box, basically. And they went on strike. They, they, they wanted a, a better rate per box. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't win the strike. But uh, we'll see. Uh, and this is the, a picture from the same factory. It's happened to be quite well documented. And this is in the mixing room where they mix all the ingredients for the chocolate. Uh, here, this is where the men are. There are some women in the background, but this is clearly some sort of gender division of labor or, or in relation to what the women were doing, what the men were doing inside the same factory. Okay. Uh, now, where is it widely used? Well, this is, Marx makes the point, and you will have read in section eight of chapter 15. He makes a lot of really interesting points about the garment industry in particular in domestic labor as being an external department of uh, factory production. And he basically says, uh, piece work is very common in domestic labor, garment industry leading example to this day, um, as well as hierarchically organized system of exploitation and oppression. And the reason is that it allows for parasites to interpose themselves and uh, by subletting the labor. And also, and a very similar arrangement is coming from a different angle, that in any given work team, the most important worker, usually a man, I guess, uh, would basically pay their assistance. So they're all paid by the product. And then that payment is further subdivided within the work team. And Marx calls attention to this type of uh, labor system and payment system uh, means that capitalist exploitation is through the mediation of the exploitation of one worker by another. This again is um, uh, domestic labor. This is a family producing dolls, I think. Um, 
And as I say, this is very contemporary and mostly very often, not entirely, of course, but very often in the global south, peace rates are used. It's connected with informalization and it's, uh, you know, specifically oppressed uh, layers of the working class are obliged to work under these conditions. So there is this sort of gender and age uh, dynamic to it, this hierarchically organized system of exploitation and oppression. Marx uh, distinguishes between the nominal wage and the real wage. So the nominal wage is the money in the pay packet, basically. Uh, uh, the real wage is what you're going to be able to buy with it, the means of subsistence placed at the disposal of the worker. And he has an example of England in the early decades of the uh, 19th century, where there was inflation and real wages were eroded. Uh, this is the point at which he brings in trade unions. And he says, of course, their role is to fight for against the reduction of wages. And this is incredibly contemporary. I mean, I'm not in this lecture going to discuss the causes of the current inflation, but the current inflation is very real. Um, and it's also about the sort of not only nominal and real wage, but nominal and real uh, content of money comes into play here, right? Um, so what we've got currently is nominal wages are very slightly increasing, but the money value of them is definitely decreasing in terms of national currency. So that's inflation, right? So fewer and fewer things can be bought, commodities can be bought with the say with the, the wage packet. So there's a decline in real wages. And just as I speak, there's a rally going on in the center of London right now about enough is enough. So this is quite uh, on point. Uh, now, labor power is a commodity form, okay? But it is not the same as any other commodity. And now Marx is really clear about the uniqueness of labor power as a commodity, right? You can't separate it from the worker. I mean, it's their labor power we're talking about. It's part of them as a, a living being. It might be alienated in the sense of handed over to the capitalists for a certain amount of time under capitalist control. But this is the functioning of the labor power in the labor process. And of course, the whole point is, as we keep on uh, getting from Marx, is the whole point is that the use value of labor power is that it's capable of adding more new value than its own value. That is a specific use value that no other commodity uh, allows a capitalist to do, right? Now, labor power's exchange value is also unique in its relation to value, right? Why is that? Because unlike any other capitalist commodity, labor power is not the direct product of capitalist producer, okay? I know people eat a lot of McDonald's these days and so on, but I mean, there's not surplus value in the wage or in the value of labor power. It's not a bearer of surplus value, okay? Now, what Marx actually, it's to say inconsistent would be unfair to him, but he, he is actually slightly inconsistent about what the exchange value of labor power is, because sometimes he'll say it's the exchange value of the commodities consumed, and as I've already quoted, he'll say it's the means of subsistence, okay? Now, they are not the same thing, okay? Uh, because if you think about it, there needs to be some necessary labor to take place to convert commodities that are bought into fully finished use values. As I've said before, I mean, the food needs to be cooked, the beds need to be made, the young kids need to be looked after and so on. So there is an awful lot of free labor in the reproduction of labor power through domestic tasks, most evidently, but also when we think of labor power in generational terms, in terms of the caring of uh, young, old workers and so on. So time and time again, in the capitalist mode of production, as the capitalist mode of production functions, women workers put in a double shift. They, even if they are wage workers, they will have to, you know, they're expected have to is probably wrong waiting with the words they're expected to put in a lot of work in the home to reproduce the labor power of themselves and their partners and very often their children right okay so this work keeps the value of labor power below 
the value which it creates in production. And without this, it, it would have a much higher uh, exchange value. So there's a slight breaking of the general rule here on in terms of the relation between the substance and the form of the value of labor power, between its value and its exchange value. Now, uh, Marx is also very good, and this is something which distinguishes him, and I, it definitely based on his philosophical uh, background yep. and training, in terms of the question of social form. He, he sees capitalism as generating quite specific social forms. And a social form is something which is objectively real. It's real in society, but it's not a natural reality. It's a social reality that's been created. OK, so he, he makes this point very strongly in relation to the commodity. The commodity is a labor product, but it's only under certain social conditions that the labor product will become a commodity, which is something which has got an exchange value. And from this, Marx, if you will recall, he generates the idea of the commodity form and money, okay, from simple commodity production. Now, these are both prerequisites for understanding capitalist commodity production. Now, what we're coming to is turning the circle. The wage form is a necessary consequence of capitalist production as well. It's a social form of capitalist production. And this is not the same as the magnitude of the wage. It's not the wage rate, but it's the form in which the commodity labor power is exchanged. It's exchanged for a wage. It's the exchangeability characteristic of labor power as it functions as a commodity. Okay. Now, political economy before Marx just really didn't consider this issue at all. Okay. Uh, I mean, this is my observation. I think that you can think of capital as a book, right, in terms of the concentration in volume one on the class relation in the process of production. In volume two, I mean, it's not secret, it's about circulation, the uh, concentration on process. And in volume three, I mean, both those first two volumes, Marx brings in social forms, okay? But it's in volume three that this really comes into play heavily. The, the distinguishing social forms of the capitalist mode of production are how the commodity appears as a not only a value form but as a capital form and how profit the, the form of appearance of surplus value now i'm saying all this because the wage form is the form of appearance of the necessary labor time and we can we see from marx that it disguises its true essence right but also he will reach the point where the surplus labor time also has a form of appearance which disguises its real essence and that's the, the profit form okay so this is just this is commentary for me really i mean it's based on marx very fully but what i'm saying is you can think of the development of marx's argument as a continuing developing dialectic between substance and form of appearance and so first of all it's a socially necessary labor time and then he subdivides this as a, as we've seen between necessary labor time and surplus labor time and in all of these cases he develops how they appear as being different from the essence in the capitalist mode of production okay now we finally and this chapter is quite challenging chapter 22 again he goes back to chapter 17 Again, a bit like the beginning of chapter 17, actually, he says that there are multiple factors uh, going into national differences of wages. And here I've highlighted what he writes. OK, um, now the one that he actually concentrates on is this last one. And he doesn't, you know, for purposes of simplification, it's perfectly understandable. He concentrates on variations in the productivity and the intensity of labor as being uh, causing differences, uh, how they work with national differences in wages. And what he also establishes is that the unit of comparison is, is back to the peace wage. It's the, how much uh, the wage is for a same type of commodity 
in produced. Okay, so he's back to the peace wage, and he explains why that's you have to do that in order to understand how productivity and intensity of labor uh, compare across different nations. And he basically says um, you can have a country where the average intensity of labor is more intense, in which case more value is produced in a given amount of time. He's thinking of England here compared to continental European countries of the time. And also you can have a country where the social productivity of labor has reached a higher level. And again, he, he sort of sees that as a point of distinction between England and continental Europe at the time. So he then brings these two into bearing. Okay. And he basically says the capitalism was more developed in England at the time. And so it's possible to have unequal international values which are expressed in different prices. But there's a further complication, which is you've got to ask prices, well, that's money. Are we talking gold? Or are we talking national currency? He's very well aware that this is a further com complication. And so he sort of acknowledges that's the case because you have to think of the relative value of the money between one nation and another. But he says, well, even allowing for that complication, let's just go back to uh, another point, if you like, right? And this is this is quite an important point now, and I think I'm getting close to the end of my time, but I do want to make this point, right? The daily or weekly wage in the First Nation, which would be England in our example, is higher than in the second, which would be, say, Austria or continental country, right? While the relative price of labour the price of labor as compared both to surplus value and the value of the product stands higher in the second than in the first. So what he says here, in a way, is that the workers in England might be more, have a higher wage, okay? But because the intensity and productivity of labor is high in England, then actually they're producing more value and there might even be a higher rate of surplus value against them, okay? So he says, the English factory inspector proves by comparing the statistics of continental states that in spite of lower wages and much longer hours of work on the continent, continental labor is in proportion to the product dearer than English. Now this thing about the cost of the labor power and the productivity of the labor power is a major issue to this day, right? In international comparisons of, of uh, commodity production. So uh, there are quite a few qualifiers to this uh, chapter from Marx, right? The first that I've already said, but just to reinforce it, is he only compares two of the multiple factors. What about hierarchies of uh, oppression and exploitation? He's looking at in he's looking at sort of standalone comparison between European countries, right? Uh, both of which that he sees as on a line of capitalist development. And he doesn't bring in the, the major factor, which is really important in relation to England, and then by extension, the whole world, the question of colonization, imperialism, movements of capital, and some economies being subordinated by others, which, you know, if you like, for example, England and Ireland, in uh, Britain and India. Okay, so the, he doesn't bring in the whole question of capitalist underdevelopment in, in his example. So. It is an example, and it does fit a certain set of circumstances, but it's not the whole of the capitalist mode of production, right? And if you want to think about that more, I do recommend, well, this is part why we have a project which sort of presupposes that people will want to study the whole three volumes, because in a way you need to. We need to get to international prices of production in order to understand how this really works in the capitalist mode of production. And it is a major, major point. It's a really important contemporary debate about how imperialism operates in the world today. And I do draw attention to the, the bibliography here. Uh, there's a debate raging uh, about this. Um, John Smith's book is very important. Marini's book is absolutely essential. Uh, and then you have people who say, well, yeah, well, maybe we're still a bit like what Mark said back in back in the day there. And so you have, Junera, uh, Jane Hardy, and so on, arguing from that side. So it's a real debate. Okay. 
and I know can see it. once again I'm close to the end of my time I just do want to take three more minutes the world is divided I mean the large-scale production in some parts of the world requires raw materials this is a picture of uh, Chile a uh, massive extraction of wood products which are pulp and then turned into paper and uh, other types of wood products right but what it means is they're destroying the natural forests in, in, in that part of Chile and that part of Chile is uh, traditionally uh, the homeland of the Mapuche people so they're resisting it and this is part of uh, they resist it through direct action as you can see here and they've been put in prison there's uh, 10 of them in prison and they will go on trial later in this year and we are campaigning for their release because we see them as political prisoners and i'm very glad that the, the sheffield left have also joined in with this support for the mapuche prisoners you can see on the top right their protest and similar things are going on in other parts of the world in peru 80 uh, people mostly will be indigenous poor peasants workers have been killed in the last six weeks uh, protesting there so these things the, the distinction between capitalism as it is in one part of the world and as it is in another part of the world is a very real and live distinction it's not a, a hypothetical point by any means okay all right i think i will end there for now and uh oh yeah that was the last picture <laughs> I'm abusing, I'm just, I'm just not abusing, I'm using my platform to draw attention to these ongoing struggles. Okay, that's it for me for now.